Could I just say a few words about the Global Change Institute? I've been talking to Ove about it uh, of late, and I am really impressed with what the university's done with this institute. I think that you've created something quite, quite unique here. There's nothing that I'm aware of anywhere else in a university anywhere on the planet that's doing this sort of thing. And I think it's really, it is so powerful, um, particularly your initiative of bringing students together uh, during their PhD period uh, from right across the disciplines, whether it's arts or sciences, uh, to look at issues relating to global change and to fund them to get together and uh, do a project in that area. I think that's, that's really, really fantastic. So it's an honour for me to be here. I think it's a very, very lively and interesting uh, institution. So what I'm going to talk about this evening, I'll have to stay here, I think I'll have to occasionally turn around like that, um, is it's, it's a bit of a different take on, um, on our future, I guess, and on the future impact of, of climate change. So I'll start with just, a, just going over the basics, because there may be some people in the audience who, who uh, need a bit of a refresher there. But then go on to look at life out to 2050, where we're going, what it means, what we can do about it. And I've called the talk The Governed Planet because I think if we start thinking about the planet as a governed planet, it really uh, it prompts us to think about our interactions with Earth in different ways. At the moment, we're running, we're, we are running an uncontrolled experiment with our only home. Um, the alternative is to live on a governed planet. So climate change is hardly new science. This, this guy here, uh, John Tyndall, back in 1859, used this fantastic bit of steampunk sort of machinery here uh, to, to, to demonstrate that uh, CO2 uh, captures heat energy. And within a couple of years of him making that demonstration, people were speculating about how varying concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere might be affecting Earth's climate. By the 1970s, we had computer models, um, and they have become immensely more sophisticated over time, but the message has always been the same. Um, I just want to show you this group of graphs from, I think these are from 2001. Um, they concern average temperatures over the 20th century, so from 1900 to 2000, and the black line there is the actual data records for temperatures for that given part of the planet. Um, the purple envelope here results from computer modelling um, where scientists have inputted all of the natural causes of climate variation, so sunspots um, uh, and so forth, the whole volcanoes and so forth, a whole lot of, oh sorry, pushed the wrong button, a whole lot of natural things. And then the red envelope is computer modelling that includes all of that data but also includes the human inputs, the greenhouse gases we're putting into the atmosphere. And the reason I show this is that you can see very clearly that in case after case, the computer modelling only matches the real world data if we include the human inputs. So this is how we know that we are actually affecting the temperature. This is historical data that we can ground proof against our inputs or against natural earth systems. More recently, scientists have found a more elegant way of trying to uh, express the, the human impact. And you have it here in the Anthropocene Equation. It was published, I think, in February this year. Um, and basically, it, this equation here represents an enormous amount of scientific research. Um, you can see that in the past, for the last four billion years, Earth's system has been affected by astronomical forces, geophysical forces and internal dynamics. But for the last 40 years, we've had to add a new factor to the equation to make it balance. And that new factor is the human factor here, and it is very, very large. It is driving global change now at a rate many, many times greater than the normal systems. In fact, by some calculations, up to 130 times faster than the natural systems. I love crossovers between art and science, and this guy here that produced this piece of art is one of my favourite scientists. He's a Melbourne-based scientist. He buys files from computer gaming stores and then uses science to assemble a meaningful piece of art. 
What he's done here is express graphically the number of barrels of oil that are extracted from Earth's crust every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every year. And I put it up because it gives us some sense of the enormous river of hydrocarbons that we are drawing out of Earth's crust and burning and in placing in our atmosphere. So that's just the oil, right? Remember, the, the natural gas and the coal on top of that adds up to an enormous flow coming out of the rocks under our feet and into the atmosphere. It's really hard to get a sense of the scale of it, but this piece of artwork really gives me, at least, a sense of the enormous scale of the geoengineering that we're doing, the way we're changing this planet. And of course, all of that stuff, you burn it and you create, for the carbon in it, 3.66 times as much CO2. So back in 2010, someone calculated the total volume of CO2 we're in placing in the atmosphere and, of course, how it's used. So it's used for good things. It's used for transporting us, for feeding us, for heating our houses and so forth. Um, but the volume is enormous. So in 2010, it was about 49 gigatons. So how big is that number? Well, if you think about the number of humans on the planet, there's about, what, 7.4 billion of us. We'd weigh on average about 30 kilograms. You, you can do the calculation and work it out, but you know, you'd probably need to put us all into the atmosphere a couple of times over to come up with a figure on, you know, on that scale. And of course, that number's from 2010. It's gone up since then. We're now at 53, perhaps 54, 55 gigatons. We don't know, but somewhere in that range. <coughs> the impacts are now very clear. Now, when I started talking about climate change in the 2000s, it was a theoretical problem for most people because the CO2 hadn't built up to the extent where it was creating changes that we could all see and become aware of. Sure, if you're an Inuit person, or, or a farmer in a marginal area in South Africa or Southern Australia, you may have seen impacts, but a lot of us hadn't. Today, that's just not the case. Everyone uh, with open eyes can see some impacts. They know over their lifetime that things have changed. And every ecosystem is being affected. We've detected changes across every ecosystem on the planet. I just want to talk about Papua New Guinea a bit. I was sitting next to a gentleman in the front row there who's also spent a huge amount of time in Papua New Guinea. I spent most of my early career there. And these, are, these tree kangaroos are two of the species that I was fortunate enough to discover and name in the 1980s and 1990s. They're really beautiful animals, but from a climate perspective, the thing that's important about them is that they live on the summits of mountains. So they're restricted by climatic zonation to the cooler areas at the summits of mountains. And we know from historical studies done uh, over the, well, recently, but concerning specimens collected over the 20th century, that on the island of New Guinea, tree lines have risen by about 300 metres for the one degree Celsius of warming that's occurred over the last century. So that doesn't seem like a lot, but, you know, specimens of birds collected in 1900 were collected way, way lower than they occur today, 300 metres lower. We know that the Paris Agreement, uh, our combined ambition at the moment, will see temperatures at about 3.3 degrees above the pre-industrial average um, by 2100. So we've got to think that that is going to go up another 600 metres. Now this, this tree kangaroo lives on a very low mountain range. It will probably be driven to extinction by the end of the century just by that warming. This one also very, very vulnerable, but has a little bit more latitude. If we go up to four degrees, that one's probably gone as well. And that's, you know, they are two very beautiful species, but they are two among thousands that are restricted to those mountain ranges in New Guinea. And New Guinea is just one island on the planet where there are thousands and thousands of mountain ranges and, and organisms that are unique to those mountain ranges, which are made vulnerable by this. So when we talk about every ecosystem on Earth, I just want to unpack a little bit that this is one ecosystem we don't think about very much, the world's alpine flora and fauna, but which is really exquisitely vulnerable to a warming planet. 
Of course, our food security is threatened as well. The size of fish that are being uh, fished are shrinking, not just through overfishing, but from warming waters. So these fish from the North Atlantic, just an average um, lot of fish from the North Sea, you can see here, scientific report that lets us know that one to two degree degrees of warming of the waters they live in over a 40 year period has resulted in a 20%, 23% decrease in size. So we're losing our food security. And even on land, our food security is threatened, obviously, by these changes. Um, CO2 acts as a fertiliser, it causes plants to grow quickly, but because the same nutrient base is available for those plants, food quality is compromised as CO2 elevates. And uh, crops like wheat and, and rice are particularly vulnerable. A study published just uh, well, a decade ago or so now suggested that um, by 2050 we would have seriously compromised food security, particularly in places like China, um, under the current trajectory. So we finally did something about climate change in Paris um, after 21 years of meetings. Right? I was involved, as I've said, at the COP15 after 15 years of meetings uh, where we thought we were going to make a breakthrough. But um, Climate Gate, that great conspiracy by those who didn't want to see action, uh, along with a number of other unfortunate coincidences that, well, incidences that I was well, really an eyewitness to as chair of the uh, Climate Council meant we didn't get action. I must say the most depressing year of my life was uh, 2010, was the year after that meeting failed, because you realise that if we'd have made change then, we could have done things in a more gradual, less disruptive way and a more impactful way. So having failed at Copenhagen, we had six years in a row of emitting more than 50 gigatons of CO2 per annum. Vast, vast volumes which emplaced in the atmosphere tend to stay there. So one of the problems with CO2 is that half of that 50 gigatons that we put up there will last a century and a quarter of it effectively lasts forever. Very hard to get it out unless we are active. It was an amazing meeting to go to, by the way. The French were just incredibly professional about getting an outcome, much better than the Danes. Um, it was, you know, the, um, the chair here, the foreign minister, um, was just, I watched him sit in the chair and um, he took a 49 page uh, unworkable document, edited it back to 26 pages, throwing out everyone's favourite clauses and sat there for eight hours in the chair as he was abused roundly by one delegation after the other for taking out his favourite clause. He just said, yes, yes, next, yes. Never lost his calm. At the end of it said, so it's passed, yes, good. <laughs> And so we got the Copenhagen Accord. It was quite an incredible feat of, um, of diplomacy. But I want to go a little bit beyond that. Just We have now got that global agreement that has energised business, that business know that, that the world is serious now about climate change and by and large is acting. Um, but we have a very serious problem, which is it concerns the, the, the carbon budget. And it's worth trying to understand this budget here because when scientists talk about carbon budgets and two degrees of warming, it's sort of important to know what they mean. So the carbon budget as is framed by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, tells us how much additional CO2 we can emplace into the atmosphere before we'll be committed really to two degrees of warming or have a very high chance of reaching two degrees of warming. The current... <coughs> um, the current budget suggests that we've got something like 10 to 20 years of emissions before we get to that point. But the current budget has some real problems that I'll, I'll unpack. So just to explain the carbon budget, this uh, unfortunately is in, carb is, is in carbon rather than CO2, so you've got to multiply by 3.6, but you've got that massive flow of hydrocarbons, coal and gas coming from the Earth's crust where it's been locked away safely for millions of years. That's about 9.3 gigatons of carbon. So 30, 30 odd, 35, 36 gigatons of CO2, somewhere in that, that range. Um, we then have some carbon coming into the atmosphere from land use change, around a gigaton. So that's forest destruction, soil destruction, 
uh, cattle, um, you know, methane, all that sort of stuff. And then we have some, thank heaven, some of that carbon goes back into trees and into soils and into the oceans. So the ocean sink is sort of, it's good to have, but it's problematic because as some of the CO2 gets into the oceans, it causes ocean acidity. But here's the bit that stays there. That's the stuff, about half stays up in the atmosphere and half of that half lasts for more than a century and a quarter of that half lasts effectively forever. So these are uh, figures which are as yet unpublished but um, give some sense of how the warming planet's affecting the carbon budget. See, when the carbon budget was framed, people assumed that certain factors would remain stable. So the carbon sinks of the Earth, for example, would remain stable. It's now clear that that's not the case. That in, and what that means is that the carbon budget that we thought we had is smaller than the carbon budget that we in fact have. So among the factors that are uh, the carbon sinks that are weakening uh, the land and ocean sinks, and they're weakening to the point where probably we've got 125 gigatons less in the budget than we thought we had. The thawing of the permafrost is happening quickly and that's taken another 45 gigatons away. You can imagine, imagine having a bank account in a bank with 100 bucks in it, you know, 100 dollars in it, and then something changes and all of a sudden you've only got 80 dollars in it, right? Then you've only got $79 in it. Then another 25 gigatons has to come out because the Amazon forest is dying. And then another 30 because of northern forest dying. And then another 10 because bacteria in the ocean are becoming more, their, their respiration's increasing because of the increased temperatures. So all of a sudden you've got $70 in your bank account rather than 100. Not very good news. That's the total, about 235 gigatons out of the, out of the budget. That's bad enough, but one of the other factors that we really have to face with this carbon budget is that when it was framed by the IPCC, they decided to leave out the warming impacts of nitrous oxide and methane, which are two very potent greenhouse gases responsible for 16 or 17 per cent of the total warming. And the reason they left that out was it was a very common sense one at the time. It was that the, the warming potential of those gases was being offset by the cooling potential of particulate pollution smogs and so forth that, um, uh, you know, the, you see it in polluted cities in China, that brown stuff that, that sits in the air, particulate pollution. We now know, however, that China, and particularly China, is moving in a very determined way to clean up their air. And there's no doubt they'll succeed, just as Britain succeeded following the great smog of 1952. So that additional warming potential, again, has to be added to the budget at some point down the road. So the summary of that unpublished data, which is in a submitted manuscript by Stefan and others, Rockstrom, is that their central estimate is that with 235 gigatons out of the budget, with nitrous oxide and methane accounted for, we really are already over budget, that we're already pretty much committed to two degrees of warming. Now, I've sort of seen this creeping over the years and it's really deeply concerned me. Um, even if it's half right, even if we've got half the carbon budget we thought we had, we still have a very limited window of opportunity to reduce our emissions strongly and even that won't be enough. If we want to stay, particularly if we want to stay at one and a half degrees, we need a very large input from as yet uninvented or, or very new technologies uh, that might be able to draw some CO2 out of the air. So that 25% that'll stay there forever, we need to get some of that out. So for the rest of the, the lecture, I just want to concentrate on how we might get some of the gas out of the air, because it's an area that's not really, it's sort of on the periphery of, of science at the moment. People in the scientific community talk about BECS, which is um, uh, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. So it means you kind of burn biomass, trees or crop residue or whatever, make energy and then take the CO2 and place it in geological strata. This is an example of a, of a carbon capture and storage plant. This one takes fossil fuels, burns it and um, puts the gas in the ground. Um, 
it's increasingly evident that these sort of approaches are, are not scalable. They're just too expensive and the geological reservoirs aren't necessarily where you need them. So there's not a lot of money being invested in these approaches at the moment. Almost everything else in this area is pretty speculative and um, my insights into it have come about through these two gentlemen here, particularly the guy who's tossing the earth in his hands, Richard Branson. Um, I remember in 2007, 2007, yes it was, um, I was walking down the street in Sydney and my phone rang and um, someone said, hello, it's Richard here. I said, oh, hello, Richard. I didn't know which Richard it was. He said, would you come to my island to talk to my people about climate change? And I said, then I knew which Richard it was. So, <laughs> so I, I flew off on Virgin and I went to, went to his island and talked to his people, spent about a week. It was, would have been, yeah, a week all up, but with three or four days with the group. Um, and at the end of that, Richard had a pretty good grasp of the situation and he said to me, um, look, my business is really people, it's understanding people. He said, and I don't think that we are going to come to this problem in time. He said, I'd like to develop an insurance policy. And I said, well, what, is, what, what do you mean, an insurance policy? He said, well, I'd like to offer a prize for the first technology that seems capable of withdrawing a gigaton of CO2 per annum out of the atmosphere. And so I, I said to him, look, we've got the Copenhagen meeting coming up chairing the council, I think we're going to be okay, you know, but he said, no, no, I really want to do it. So I said, great, okay, I'll help you do it. So we'll make it a 25 million pound prize. Well, so myself, Al Gore and a couple of others are the judges on that prize and we will have some very exciting news, I think, in the relatively near future. Um, but it's been 10 years now, 11 years, um, we've seen 11,000 entries come through the system. Uh, they range from totally insane to uh, <laughs> deeply impressive um, and we are getting close to uh, a very, very short list. It turns out that when you look at all of these approaches, there are two ways really of getting CO2 out of the atmosphere. One of them is biological, which sounds wonderful and green. The other one is chemical, which people probably are going to hate the sound of. But in fact, both of them are very valid and interesting approaches. Um, one way you can... Uh, get CO2 out of the atmosphere is by planting trees. Fabulous way of doing it. The big problem that trees have is scalability. So if we looked at, go back to that 50 gigatons odd a year going into the atmosphere and ask yourself the question, how many trees would we need to plant to take 10% of that or five gigatons out of the atmosphere? Does anyone have any idea? You'd need to cover all of the United States of America, including Alaska in forests and have it all growing vigorously to be able to, on average, over a half century period, take five gigatons or so per annum out of the atmosphere. So it's a big problem, as I say, about these vast rivers of hydrocarbons going from, carb from the Earth's crust into the atmosphere. They're, they're so large, it's, it's hard to comprehend. So tree planting will be important, but it's not going to solve the problem. If you look at the soil carbon store of our planet, it's about twice as big as the living biological carbon store. So if we can treat our soils with a bit more kindness, if we can um, use cell grazing, for example, um, and, and practices, sustainable practices that keep carbon in the soil in the form of root mass, humus, and other carbon materials, we can store lots of carbon, get it out of the atmosphere and store it. But as the Earth warms, of course, the metabolism of the planet increases and it becomes a little bit more difficult to do that. Not impossible, but a bit more difficult to do it. But I do hold up some hope that approaches like biochar, cell grazing and so forth could perhaps are scalable to some extent, up to the gigaton scale. The real sleeper in this whole area, though, has been seaweed farming. Um, we, uh, people haven't really appreciated the potential of seaweed farming uh, to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. And it's one area I just want to spend a little bit of time thinking about. I'll come back to that point, but I'll just run through the, 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 uh, the chemical pathways. So one of the principal ways that Earth has maintained the CO2 balance through geological history is through the weathering of a particular kind of rocks called silicate rocks. So they're formed uh, mid-ocean ridges and other places. Um, 
they have the capacity as they weather to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. So if you can accelerate their weathering, perhaps we can do something about, about CO2. Building materials is another great area. You know, we are, at the moment, um, cements and um, concretes co account for about 8% of global emissions. We're going through a massive building boom and it's only going to grow because you know, not only is India, China's growing now, India will be the next, and then Africa, which by the end of the century will have four billion inhabitants, will all need to be housed. So think of the opportunities there. People are already making carbon negative concrete blocks, including some that we'll see soon. Um, but carbon neutral cements are available right here in Queensland. They cost about 3% more than average concretes and cements, but they don't come with the emissions. Very, very important. A sectoral carbon price in this area will be very interesting. Then there's direct air capture, which again is not a very widely known phenomenon, but it is, a, it is a, an industrial reality right now. So I've seen a, a direct air capture plant in Switzerland that's probably four times the size of this uh, theatre, and it can capture the equivalent of a thousand hectares of forest in terms of CO2, so extremely efficient CO2 capture. Just to give you an idea of the land surface and just to remind you that to plant all of the USA in trees would give us about five gigatons of CO2. Oh, oh, this was a man who pioneered cell grazing. I'll just, uh, I won't waste time on that. I'll go straight to seaweed farming. But let's have a look at seaweed farming uh, as an as a opportunity. The first thing you'll probably notice about seaweed is it hasn't got any roots or trunk or anything else. The whole plant is photosynthetic. Right? And when the nutrients are available and conditions are right, it can grow very fast. 30 times more or, or more uh, faster than land-based plants. And the other great thing about seaweed is it's, a, it's already a developed industry, a multi-billion dollar a year industry, and we have the potential to sequester the carbon very efficiently. Once seaweed or any other carbon gets below about a kilometre depth in the oceans, it is sequestered. So there's potential there to do that. The main scoping study uh, looking at the potential of seaweed was done out of the University of the South Pacific back in 2012. Researchers there figured that if you could cover 9% of the world's ocean in seaweed farms, you could effectively sequester 53 gigatons of CO2 per annum, plus produce enough fish and shellfish to, to give 200 kilograms per year of food, high quality protein, to a population of 10 billion people. That's kind of amazing, huh? And I was so excited when I read this, so this has got to be the solution. Then I thought, I'd better check out how big 9% of the world's oceans is. And it um, <laughs> turns out to be dismayingly large. It's, um, it's, it's about uh, four and a half times the size of Australia. So, like, covering that area in seaweed farms, right, big, big job. But there's where you might do it, right? The, the blue half of the Earth. Oceans cover 71% of our planet. And there are large calm areas there, the doldrums, uh, which could conceivably be used for seaweed aquaculture and be drawing down lots of uh, CO2. Those areas of the planet are biological deserts, and they're biological deserts because there's no, no nutrients in that top sunlit part of the ocean. And that's a problem for growing seaweed because you need nutrients, right? So where are the nutrients going to come from? People who are most advanced in thinking about this are a group called Ocean Permaculture Arrays. They come out of, um, out of uh, Woods Hole Institute in the, in the USA, a, group, a smallish group of very talented engineers who are looking at building, in fact are at the moment building their first demonstration plant uh, to grow seaweed in the deep ocean. And this is a little model of how it works. So the seaweed farm itself is sunk about 25 metres below the surface so that um, it's not a shipping hazard. And there's still lots of sunlight down 25 metres, incidentally. You have an array here, square array the seaweed is grown on. It's all, that's known technology. We know how to propagate kelp now and how to grow it and various other seaweeds. And the interesting bit, though, is this tube down here that goes down to about 350 metres, certainly below 300 metres. And that is bringing up very cold, relatively unsalty and very nutrient-rich water from depth, which you can pump up, use to irrigate this crop, and because the water is less salty, even though it's cold, it doesn't sink, it's quite buoyant. 
so the cooler water stays at the top and there's some very interesting potential uses for that. It's not the seaweed that would be the value crop here, it's, it's fish and shellfish. And integrated permaculture is already working in East Asia and other parts of the world. People prefer growing their fish and shellfish in seaweed farms because the ocean there during the day at least is buffered. You can get pHs as high as 10 around those, those, um, those seaweed farms. And so things that lay down shells or skeletons grow very quickly. This is just another shot of ocean permaculture uh, array with the buoy, the mooring. You need about two metres of, of, of head pressure to get the, the, the cold water up to the surface. It's not a large amount. And you can use wind energy, solar energy, uh, whatever, whatever you want. It's yet another shot just to show you again. There's the thermocline, for those who know your ocean, oceanography primary boy and the, the pump down there. So the first one of these uh, arrays is about um, a square kilometre and it's being built currently in the Indian Ocean. So we'll see how that, how that goes. I think there's some issues, there's economic issues certainly with this. I mean the reason that um, the coastal seaweed farms are such a success in part is that they're fairly close to market. You can get your stuff to market. There's an economic factor there. Whereas mid-ocean seaweed farms, the economics uh, are quite different and it's a pioneering technology. But you get the value of sequestration here. The stuff is, is actually, the carbon is being sequestered, if you want, and if we're willing to pay for it. So, you know, I think a carbon price is an inevitable element in the development of these, these seaweed farms. We will need a carbon price to make them work. We have to remember, of course, that the oceans aren't just a, a bottomless garbage pit. So throwing gigatons of seaweed into the deep oceans may well have consequences. There are living things down there, including these squid, um, a whole ecosystem down there, and we are woefully ignorant about impacts. The, the, the very first study um, of seaweed, natural seaweed fluxes into the deep ocean was uh, completed uh, last year. And it showed that gigatons of seaweed indeed do reach the deep ocean through trenches and storm events and so forth. Um, so it, it, canyons and, and uh, storm events and so forth. Um, but we, so it is a natural phenomenon, seaweed gets down there, but we don't know what an enhanced flow would mean. So none of these approaches I'll be talking about are, are without risk and all of them need really excellent science as a priority to guide us as we start developing potential solutions. And yet clearly the urgent need is there. We know we need to get a lot of this stuff out of the air. We need to be getting out, in my opinion, probably on the order of 20 gigatons per annum by 2050 to have a chance to stay, even with the strongest efforts at mitigation, a chance to stay below two degrees. So other people from other disciplines have also been looking at this issue. Um, Astrobiologists have looked at Mars and said, hey, that's a kind of cool planet. It's got ice caps made of dry ice, not water ice. That's kind of interesting. Why don't we get dry ice on Earth? Why aren't our ice caps made of dry ice? Dry ice is frozen CO2, by the way. So um, looked at the Antarctic and said, well, average temperatures over the Antarctic ice cap are minus 57 degrees. CO2 freezes out of the atmosphere and falls as snow at minus 78.5 degrees. You know, you can build some chiller boxes and chill the air over the Antarctic by a few tens of degrees and, and power it using wind power. There's wind turbines already in the Antarctic. So, you know, this is all doable. But how many would you need to get a gigaton a year? So the basic maths is that you would need about half the installed wind power that Germany had, say, five or six years ago. It's not a huge amount of wind turbines, but, you know, the Antarctic is a pristine continent, yeah? So there are, we all have feelings about that. Um, you'd, you'd probably have to bury the, the, um, the dry ice under, under snow and it would hopefully be a stable, or according to these people, be a stable store for CO2 well into the future. You know, and it's not as crazy as it sounds because temperatures occasionally drop to minus 90 over the Antarctic and then it really does, it does snow dry ice, right? The stuff just sublimates again as temperatures warm. Now, I don't particularly like the idea but I don't dismiss it either because I think by 2050, as climate impacts deepen, I don't want to be in the way of my children making decisions. 
that might make their life better. And this might be one that they perhaps want to look at. Carbon negative concretes, I mentioned these building blocks are from University of Sheffield. They are minus uh, the carbon negative at 14 kilograms a tonne or thereabouts. This kind of stuff is being built uh, around the world. Now, lots of groups looking at it, including University of Melbourne. Um, people are looking at, at polymers. Uh, they're looking at um, uh, 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 stru structural timbers made from uh, you know, uh, small pieces of, of, of wood fibre. A whole lot of things which are potentially to able to sequester carbon at scale. I wouldn't be surprised if all of this innovation led uh, over the next three decades or so to uh, savings, uh, not savings, but, but, but reductions on the gigaton scale. Not many gigatons, but maybe a gigaton, something like that. So we move on to chemical uh, issues because, and I should warn you, there's not a lot of options for drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere at the gigaton scale. But these rocks, these, um, these are these rocks I was talking about, silicate rocks. This is olivine, one particular kind. It's quite common in Australia and particularly Western Victoria. Um, the great study that's been done on these uh, was done by James Hansen and his colleagues, and James Hansen being one of the world's leading climate scientists. He came out with some astonishing figures. He said if we could make these rocks weather a bit faster, we could be drawing CO2 out or reduce CO2 out of the atmosphere by 30 to 300 parts per million. Right? But what that means in reality is you've got to make a quarry, dig up this rock, grind it up, transport it to somewhere like a beach or a field where it can be used uh, or where it can degrade and, and draw in the CO2. Now all of that today takes the use of fossil fuels. Right? So until we green our electricity system and our transport system, this will be uh, are not really an achievable approach. But the scale of it is very heartening. The scale of it is very heartening. There is one source of silicate rocks, though, that is already ground up for us and free. Uh, around the snouts of Greenland's retreating glaciers, there are gigatons and gigatons of rock flour, which are, on average, um, about 125 kilograms carbon neutral per tonne, potentially. So if you could transport this stuff and, and put it where it would uh, interact with CO2, you could have an, an earlier impact. But again, there are caveats around this rock flower, ground up rock clouds water. Uh, is it going to be safe to use on agricultural lands or elsewhere where we may want to use it? They're big questions that we've barely begun to investigate. Direct air capture of CO2, as I mentioned, is really one of the great interesting fields uh, for me. Um, these machines can capture CO2 very efficiently and can turn it into a variety of products. One of the most interesting and advanced of the companies using this technology are um, called Carbon Engineering. They're a Canadian-based company. Uh, they use very cheap hydroelectricity uh, to capture CO2, well they capture CO2, use very cheap electricity to manufacture um, jet fuel. And in Ju June this year, they announced that they had cracked the $100 a barrel barrier. So you might have read today that the price of oil has gone up to $81 a barrel. Uh, once it reaches $100 a barrel, these guys are well and truly in business, right? even without a carbon price. So the oil business is like a sclerotic old man. It's, um, you know, as these companies start competing at the high end, the oil price has to be constrained in a narrow band. At the low end of the price range, it's constrained by the cost of extraction, which is going up and up and up. So deep offshore wells now, the, the chief executives of the oil companies are telling us the cost of extraction will be $100 a barrel. You know, you have to be selling it for about that. Sorry, you have to be selling it for about that to... Uh, to, to, to make a profit. So this sort of breakthrough is really important. You can also use um, CO2 direct air capture to make plastics. Now, to get to the gigaton scale, we'd probably have to double plastic manufacture globally, including plastic bags, and I don't think that's a great idea. <laughs> but um, but no, what do you think, over it? <laughs> no. Anyway, the world's all about trade-offs, but you know, perhaps we can, um, 
we can do something. Uh, we, it won't be a gigaton, but perhaps we should be making all of our plastics from direct air capture rather than from fossil fuels. Again, one of the really interesting breakthroughs, um, but a very, very early stage, was made by Professor Licht here from um, uh, George Washington University in the USA. He spent his life working out how you can uh, take CO2 and make carbon fibre from it. Um, he uses a concentrator solar thermal technology that heats the CO2 to very high temperatures and then a catalyst uh, which, which uh, sees the CO2 um, uh, settle on the catalyst and grow a fibre. A very, very interesting approach. So it's totally clean. He, he's worked out, and this is kind of a bit cloud cuckoo-y, but he worked out that if we could cover 11% of the Sahara with his towers, we could sequester all of the CO2 that we currently emit in any given year. Now, what you do with that volume of carbon fibre is anyone's guess. But, <laughs> but anyway, it, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's at the laboratory stage at the moment, but a very interesting, interesting approach. And I find it particularly interesting because carbon fibre is the lightest, strongest material we know about. It'll be competing directly with steel and aluminium in certain applications. And this is taking the problem, atmospheric CO2, turning into a solution that competes with polluting industries. So we shall see, and he claims that this can be done cost competitively, but as I said, we shall see. A, a really unexpected ray of hope emerged from a man not known for giving the world hope um, <laughs> in the budget, the US budget this year. Um, a Democrat and a moderate Republican had worked together um, using some figures uh, produced by a not-for-profit organisation I'm involved with, which is the first um, carbon negative not-for-profit organisation ever to exist. It's based in California. And um, the result was this tax break. So the US announced in February 2018 that they would give a tax break of $50 per tonne for geological sequestration of carbon. Sounds kind of dismaying if you're a seaweed farmer, doesn't it? But the fact is, the meaning of geological sequestration won't be, dis won't be determined by Mr Trump, it will be determined by the agency involved. And it could well be that seaweed sequestration in the deep ocean is classified as geological sequestration, entirely possible. Certainly the um, silicate rock proposals could fall into that, that category. There's also a second tax credit for profitable use of carbon. So anything from carbon fibre to uh, engineering, carbon engineering, uh, through to growing seaweed again, maybe will be, um, is, is, is a tax deductible. And profitable use is also going to be defined by the agencies, yeah? not by the Republicans. So it'll be extremely interesting to see how this goes. The program runs for 12 years. Their definition's determined by the agencies. It is hedged around with um, clauses which make it more likely that the early adopters will be the fossil fuel industry hoping to use carbon capture and storage. But it is the very first move in what could be some quite interesting times. I'm writing a position paper for a European institute on this stuff at the moment uh, in the hope that the EU will look at this and say, actually, we can create a great driver here for sequestration of carbon in the European Union by slightly reframing the rules and creating uh, different incentives. But be, I think we're in for very interesting times. I just want to finish on an optimistic note because a lot of that's been pessimistic. Um, we've been, I've been talking about 2050 as the moment of action and we know, we know there's enough gas in the air to see the climate deteriorate through the 20s and get much worse through the 40s and potentially as 30s and then potentially catastrophic in the 40s. We sort of know that, right? Gas is there to do that. So the, the driver will be there for change. How long, though, have we got? So for us in 2018, it's impossible to imagine 2050. The only way I can do it is to go back a century and say, let's look at 1918 and compare it with 1950. So in 1918, the streets of Brisbane probably, that would have been a familiar sight. That's from London, but it, you, know, you would have seen a lot of horse transport here in Brisbane. Um, people going off to the Great War uh, fought um, with means that look totally barbaric to us today. And of course, they would have just a little bit, bit earlier, those young men, been in school, and they would have been taught from a map, something like that. 
And the teacher, if you'd have said to the teacher, but Miss, uh, the great empire is going to be there in future, she would have laughed at you and given you a whack on the backside, I suspect. Um, because, of course, they'd been there for hundreds of years. That was, the, the, nothing, that was immutable. That would not change. The first communist country in the world wasn't on the map because the October Revolution would have happened before that thing was printed. Right? But by 1950, that would have looked like an antique, not just because of the decorations, but because the empires had gone. The world had changed. So there's transport. That's a city in 1950, uh, unimaginable to a child or an adult living in 1918. No horses. They would have been able to see jet aircraft in 1950. It's impossible. Look at an old biplane or triplane and try to think that there'd be jet aircraft in the air. You couldn't do it. And the electrification of the home. You know, in 1918, homes were mum-powered. Yeah, she, she did the washing, she did the cooking and probably chopped the wood as well, all by hand. I mean, it was, you know, by 1950, this was all electrification was changing the way we lived. And what would you have said to someone in 1918 about that? I mean, Einstein's theory of relativity, the first paper was published in 1905. We knew that that was possible, the people who understood that paper. And yet, to imagine it as a reality by 1950 is inconceivable, I think, for those people living at that time. So when we think about 2050, we have to maintain our optimism. We have to maintain our sense of imagination. Because the one thing I'm certain about is that the 32 years that remain between now and 1950 are going to see more change than that that occurred between 1918 and 1950. We're an interconnected world now. We are immensely empowered. And for young people in the audience, this is your age. This is the time you can get in using tools that were not available to us to create a governed planet that's governed in everyone's interest, that addresses the big issues, and that will be a, a profitable and good world to live in. You know, when you think about that CO2 in the atmosphere, don't think about it as a problem, certainly, but also think about it as an opportunity. Ask yourself, how much are people going to be willing to pay to get that stuff out of the air by 2040? Yeah? It's going to be a lot, because the problems by then are going to be severe. And the means of doing it are there. If, I, I'm totally confident that we'll be pulling 20 gigatons of CO2 out of the atmosphere by 2050 and that we'll be living in a fully decarbonised economy. Trouble is that's probably not going to be enough. We need to be living in a carbon negative economy. Right? I mean, it's not just carbon neutral. It'll need to be a carbon negative economy. So the opportunities of that are enormous. I'm going to stop there. I've talked long enough and um, take some questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>